Um, I'm Stacey Props. I'm the marketing manager for uh, communication at Bedford St. Martin's. And before we get started, I just wanted to kind of familiarize you with some of the basic webinar procedures. Um, of course, you may have noticed that um, as you've entered the webinar that your phone has been muted, and that's just so we can avoid any background noise. We'll be recording this webinar um, for those of uh, those folks that couldn't make it today and archiving it on our website. However, just because you're muted doesn't mean we don't want to hear from you. We really encourage questions in this webinar immediately following Steve's presentation. And the easiest way to ask questions is to use the chat function on the right side of your screen. If you don't see it, you can click the chat tab at the top there on the right-hand side, um, and you should see it there in the middle of your um, middle of the right side of the screen. Um, when you send a chat message, um, please try to send it to all panelists. That way, we'll make sure that we won't miss any of your questions. That will go to Steve as well as all the Bedford folks too. So we'll make sure that we don't miss any of your questions. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker for today. Um, Steve McCornack is an Associate Professor of Communication at Michigan State University, where he's also Director of Undergraduate Studies, Honors Advisor, and Faculty Advisor to the Undergraduate Communication Association. His research interests include deception, message production, and family communication. And Dr. McCornack teaches undergraduate and graduate courses on interpersonal communication, relational communication, and language discourse. Since he began at MSU in 1988, he's received several awards for undergraduate teaching excellence, including the Amico Foundation Excellence in Teaching Award, a Lilly Endowment Teaching Fellowship, the MSU Teacher Scholar Award, and the MSU Alumni Excellence in Undergraduate Teaching Award. And Dr. McCornack was MSU's 1999 and 2010 nominee for the Carnegie Foundation United States Professor of the Year Award. So without further delay, we present teacher and scholar Steve McCormack. Thank you so much, uh, Stacey. I really appreciate that. Um, and again, uh, my thoughts and prayers are with anybody within the area affected by the storm. I know it's been in the minds of everybody, and I appreciate you folks, um, especially been suffering the, the primary effects and the after effects, taking the time today to, to hang out with me and, and talk about the issues I'm going to talk about. Um, and just to all of you, you know, welcome. It's it's so exciting to connect with fellow teachers of interpersonal and um, I, uh, you know, I'm hoping that the participant who was considering having her class join was able to sign in or will be able to sign in because I was pretty excited about that, actually being able to have some student uh, voices in the mix as well. Um, I also want to say real quick before I get going here that other than just welcoming you all, I have to comment on how stunned I am to see myself with hair. So <laughs> if you see the, the photo of me on the left-hand side of the slide, uh, about a year ago, I shaved my head. I just got sick of my hair. So, and, and I tell you this because if any of you look me up on Facebook, you know, students or or any of you, uh, you know, fellow teachers, you can always connect with me on Facebook. I just wanted to forewarn you: the profile photo you see may come as a shock. <laughs> I don't exactly look like that anymore. Anyways, so this morning I was, um, you know, teaching my interpersonal class as I do every semester, and it was kind of timely because. Um, the opening story I want to tell you folks about uh, was actually, you know, from the lecture that I gave today. And I was talking about stereotypes uh, that we have about men, women, uh, sex, and love in our culture. And, of course, the stereotypes tell us that women are so romantic and sentimental about love and men are so, well, one of our, my students chimed in this morning, aloof. And I thought that was a great descriptor, the stereotype about men. We're, we're aloof about love. And so I was talking about the stereotypes, and then we go through the correctives, you know, talking about how actually uh, when it comes to relationship decision-making, women tend to be much more practical than men, and the male view of relationships is often clouded by sentiment. Um, and, you know, when I gave this lecture a few years ago in the aftermath, you know, I, I don't really, you know, think about the consequences of, of this material. It doesn't seem that controversial. Um, but in the aftermath, I got this email from this student, and it was a very angry email. It was later in the afternoon. And uh, I'm going to put up the full exchange here. And this was via email, so you folks can see the, the three-part exchange. I'll walk you through it real quick. Um, oh, no, nope, that's the – here we go. So I sign on, and I'm just checking my email, and there's no header. There's no, you know, there's no greeting like, Dear Dr. McCornack or anything like that. It's just – starts off, stereotypes are demeaning. People should denounce them, not teach them. Why lecture about stereotypes? All in caps, just as you see it here. Um, and 
I was in a pretty bad mood at the time. <laughs> I was pretty tired. You know, I, I'm sure all of you can appreciate, you know, having taught a couple of sections that day and, and you have all the other pressures and then you get home and you start going, sifting through the, you know, pile of email. And here's this message. And I was in a sour mood, to, you know, to begin with. And I see this and I was just like, really? Are you kidding me? Uh, and so I popped back the message you see in the middle. Uh, and this was actually the exact email I sent, which was, certainly kind of snarky on my part. Uh, you know, I wrote back, uh, because people often wrongly think that they're true. Um, and then, of course, there was the inevitable delay. And about two hours later, I got the message at the bottom from him saying, uh, again, no header or, or, or greeting. Just, I think it's really disrespectful of you to treat my question so really. And then all in caps, I'm paying you to teach, not mock. And, of course, what I then responded with, because I he was obviously very upset, and I, and I wasn't quite sure what he was upset about um, because I didn't I, – the whole purpose of the lecture was to correct the stereotypes um, and, and to talk about them, and I never at any point said that they were valid, um, but something just got him, and he was very, very angry and upset. And I handled it really badly because I was really tired and just had this huge reactive to his message. And so I wrote back after after his second message, I wrote back a long apology note and just said, I'm really sorry. I, I did not mean to be disrespectful. Here's the reason that I teach it this way. But in the aftermath, it got me thinking about uh, empathy and text-based online communication. And, and I was really curious about this. You know, why is it just seem to be so commonly the case as everybody in the pop culture and in academia opines um, that when we're online, especially in text-based communication, it, there seems to be this greater uh, uh, level of incivility. And so I started reading about it, and there are a number of authors out there and, and various researchers who have, who have commented on this, including Daniel Goleman and John Suler, very commonly. Um, but the, the recent stuff that I read, which really was cool, uh, was by Jennifer Beer, who's a cognitive psychologist out in UC Davis. And she's looking at the nature of the brain and um, the relationship between empathy and feedback. And the basic issue that I'm raising, the question I'm raising as I just popped up on the screen is that, and, and what she has noticed and comments on is that, is that when we're communicating online, we're actually uh, in an empathy deficient state of perception. Um, Beer's work suggests that the empathy deficits we experience online are pretty close to the empathy reduction um, that people experience when they have traumatic brain injuries um, that really kind of shatter our ability to perceive uh, emotion accurately and especially related to, to empathy. Um, and this was really, really not, not a great surprise to me. I hadn't thought about it in terms of empathy deficit, um, but it got me really curious as to why this is the case. Why is there a, a deficit of empathy online? And before I go any further, I should just note as a side note to, to everyone, um, this is not to say that we can't be empathic online uh, via text. It's certainly not to undermine the um, positive impact of online support groups and the like. Um, certainly we can communicate empathically online, and it's, online support groups can be a wonderful vehicle for supporting others. The issue is, can we experience the same degree, and do we experience the same degree of emotional empathy, internal empathy, in a text-only environment as we do face-to-face -face or over the phone? And the answer is no, uh, we don't. We're, we're substantially deficient. And then the question, of course, is why? Well, Beer's research shows that it has to do with processing of feedback and the nature of their brain. Um, if you look at the top bullet here, and I apologize for throwing everything up at once. We, um, I couldn't get locked down on having an animation scheme here, but look at the top bullet. Um, the part of the brain, the orbital frontal cortex, is what tracks recipients or listener feedback when we're communicating, uh, both visual and verbal feedback that might provide in the form of back channel keys, facial expressions, most prominently facial expressions, the most powerful source of feedback. But if you're on the phone, vocal tone, uh, pitch, you know, through back channels. Well, that center of the brain that tracks feedback is also intertwined neurologically with the part of the brain that processes empathy. So when you take away uh, visual and or verbal vocal feedback, it really substantially attenuates our ability to feel empathy. 
Um, and also it robs us of our moment-to-moment -moment modulation of, of behavior. And I'll walk you through what I mean by that in a second. Let me talk about the front end of the second bullet first. So, you know, feedback is basically neuro neurologically tied to the experience of empathy. And in the simplest possible terms, we think about this, you know, like we're, we're lecturing about this and talking about it, thinking about it. Um, if we can't see or hear people, it's really hard to be able to empathize with them. We can, but the difficulty in doing so is, is increased exponentially. We count on being able to see, or the flip side is we count on being able to see or hear people um, to be able to empathize with them. And so when that's taken away, as it is with um, a traumatic brain injury patients, they can't, that the hardwiring there gets messed up and so they can't, you know, with some, some uh, injury patients, and so they can't process empathy, they can't process feedback. It's actually also akin to uh, a certain types of uh, autism uh, and certain types of Asperger syndrome where they, they Asperger's, I had an Asperger's student last year actually, and she talked about she couldn't accurately process people's feedback when she was speaking and consequently couldn't empathize. Um, so when that's removed, we, we can't experience empathy, and then the, the, we also can't modulate our behavior moment to moment. And this is key for being a skillful, competent communicator, right? Because what happens when we're communicating with people you know, over the phone, like I'm doing with you now, or we're um, you know, via Skype or face-to-face, -face, one of these real-time, immediate back and forth, not asynchronous, uh, communication media um, is we can monitor people's feedback and we do constantly we listen to, to tone of voice we watch facial expression we look at eye contact and everything and if I'm midway through an utterance and I notice that you're wincing <laughs> or having some other noteworthy negative reaction immediately I can I can you know switch it up midstream I can shift the emphasis of my utterance uh, to, to, you know, some other direction to try and save my face, make you feel better about what I'm saying or whatever the need is. So we, we deploy this very skillfully, moment to moment, without even thinking about it. We change it up uh, midstream all the time based upon feedback. You know, when we all are in lecture, right, we do this. <laughs> I was doing this yesterday. I was, I was lecturing in my language class. And, uh, you know, I see some people rolling their eyes and kind of, you know, fidgeting and immediate, and I'm in the middle of describing something, and all of a sudden I realize, this isn't hitting right. I need to mix it up. And so I just shift emphasis and try and, you know, and portray it with a different example. It's a bit more dramatic and engaging. So we do this all the time, but when we can't see or hear people, we, we are robbed of our ability not only to empathize, but also to change our behavior midstream. So what's the outcome of this? We think about communicating in text-based environments. Well, I know this is not surprising to any of you, probably, when you think about, you know, it, it seems to be a common lament within the online world, um, which is the, in general, the, the incivility of text-based online discourse and the incivility that occurs within uh, uh, online, um, you know, chat groups and this kind of thing. There are a number of reasons for this. There's the asynchronicity and perceived anonymity, but a big part of it is just empathy. Um, and so the outcome of the empathy deficits that occurs in text-based environments is people are ruder. We see a much greater frequency of inappropriate offensive messages. And then if you think about the second bullet, I, I really love this one. I think this is hilarious because this is the kind of things that you'll hear people, uh, I hear students of mine say all the time, uh, you know, when they talk about online rudeness, and I include here, you know, texting, of course, um, well, they'll say, oh, this person would never say this to me, to my face. Exactly, yes, they wouldn't. <laughs> Quite literally, they would not say it to your face because people will express themselves in text-based environments, whether it's email, wall posts on social networking sites, chat rooms, text, they will say things online uh, via text-based media that they would never say in person, or over the phone, or via Skype, because I can see or hear you, and I so therefore I can see the impact, and if I can't, then my ability to empathize with you um, and adjust my communication is radically uh, reduced. Now, there's another really interesting uh, outcome of this that my students brought to my attention, and it's this one. Um, People will trend toward text-only environments when they don't want to feel empathy or when they think the effort 
of having empathy is just too much. I don't want to deal with that. And so we see this thing that was like spoofed years ago in Sex in the City. There was, a, there was an episode of Sex in the City, which my students you know, still talk about, where um, Carrie got dumped um, by a guy uh, through a Post-it note. <laughs> and so that's the general thrust of the episode. Is how can somebody break up through a Post-it note? Um, well, because from the delivery side at that moment, it's easier. I don't have to deal with uh, empathizing with you. I don't have to see your reaction. Uh, my mom used to do this back in the day. She uh, she doesn't do it so much anymore, but she, my mom used to do this, uh, where if she got really mad at me, she wouldn't call me. Uh, she wouldn't text me or email me. Uh, I was kind of actually before she got text adroit, and she texts me now. Um, but she would call my home phone at a time she knew I was in school, you know, you know, teaching or, or doing, you know, research, and leave a voicemail because she knows I wouldn't be there. So she drops a bomb. Actually, she called us, you know, dropped a bomb. Um, and and why? Well, because it's easier in terms of empathy. And so, you know, in talking to my students about this in my classes, and this is a great, you know, uh, issue to bring up for for a discussion exercise. Um, students, on the one hand, will say. I hate it when people, uh, you know, I just think it's completely inappropriate to break up with somebody or, or be rude or something through text. But when they're dealing with a challenging conflict or a, a difficult relationship problem, oftentimes they'll trend toward text only if they don't want to deal with the emotional demand of the situation, if they just want to drop that message bomb, you know, that, that mean message, and say something snarky and walk away. Or if it's even more complicated and they just want to, you know, break up because it's empathy easier. So here's an activity I want to share with you um, to shift gears a bit, um, you know, to, to get at this. And it's kind of a, an interesting and, you know, fun activity. You can do this in a, in a, you know, I have a number of activities and two I'm going to talk through with you uh, uh, this afternoon. So um, this is an activity I do, and you can do it in class as a group discussion activity. You can do it as a take-home assignment. For if you're an online uh, interpersonal teacher, you can do this as an online activity, obviously. Um, and, and here's the activity. It's a hypothetical situation. It's a variation of this actually showed up in my textbook in the second edition. Um, and it's one I call the Ron Dilemma. It's based on work that Barbara O'Keefe uh, did on message effectiveness down at the University of Illinois. So the situation I put my students in, and this is a great one, actually, to do actually as a class activity as a whole. You just put this up on the board and say, what would you say, and get them talking about it. Um, the Ron dilemma is you've been assigned to a group project in one of your classes, and your final grade depends in part on how well you, you know, do in the project as a whole. The professor selects you as the group leader, so you have a certain degree of responsibility. I'm just kind of summarizing for you. You can read along. Um, your duties include reporting to the professor the effort output from each member. So in effect, you have control over the other, per, other group members' evaluations, um, and in part their grade. Well, there's this guy, Ron, in the group that's been causing some problems. He uh, doesn't make it to group meetings on time. He totally blew off one meeting without calling anybody in advance. Um, and at the next meeting, Ron arrives late, but then he apologizes for missing the previous meeting, and he mentions that he's been having some family problems. He then volunteers to make up for his absences, um, by doing some extra work on one aspect of the project, seeing as a special interest in this. So now it's Thursday. The group project is due next week, um, and you're doing a presentation next week as well as a part of this. And you scheduled for tomorrow, Friday afternoon, um, you know, this, this dry run rehearsal of the, of the group project in its entirety. So it's Thursday afternoon. You get an email from Ron, and Ron says that he doesn't have his research done. He can't get it done by tomorrow. He says he needs more time. So you're sitting there at your computer. What do you say to Ron? Um, now, when you have people take this home, you have students take this home as an assignment and then bring back in their messages. Um, and again, an online, if you teach an online class, you can do this online activity. Just have them create messages. What would you say to Ron? It's really interesting because you'll, you'll see, of course, huge variation in message response. But what you'll also see is, um, especially because of the little online wrinkle to him here at the end. Ron is sent this via email. And if you have people, you tell people, you know, respond to Ron that way. Um, what you'll see is an escalation in the lack of empathy. That is, people will be really mean to Ron. Um, 
And oftentimes it gets kind of funny because what I do as a group activity with this is I have I separate people into groups and I just have each group kind of decide what they want to say to Ron. And then um, I have people, and that buffers people a little bit if they don't feel comfortable saying personally what they would say. And then you bring it back to the whole and you have everybody kind of share. And when people start sharing the things they say to Ron, it's sometimes it can be outright abusive. I mean, Ron, you stupid jerk, I can't believe you don't have done. I'm going to make sure you flunk and I'm going to go to the professor and this kind of thing. So you let them vent and say all the, and some people are very effective, you know, trying to deal with Ron empathically, but, but it really gets a, especially a little online twist there, you know, the empathy deficits that mark many people's messages when they're using email. So then once I have them generate the message, then I throw the two Rons up on the screen. And here are the two Rons. Ron number one is a 60-year senior who's always been scamming. He's just a total scammer. He's just a game player. And how he gets by is basically abusing people's trust. And he loves, loves, loves group projects. Why? Because he can slide by without doing anything. And then right at the last minute, he can make up a big story about family problems and lie his way out of it, play the sympathy card, and then, and then get you to give him a pity grade. And so that's Ron, right? And so no, man, not this time. Ron, I'm bringing the hammer down. I'm going to set you straight. I'm not going to let you, you, uh, you know, put one over on me. Well, then there's Ron number two. Ron number two is a straight-A student who's working two jobs to put himself through school, and he's commuting from home. And he's the primary care provider to both his terminally ill mother and his younger brother. And his younger brother's been getting in a lot of trouble at school. And so Ron's got to drive back and forth from school back home trying to straighten his brother out. And what's happened in the last 24 hours is his brother's gotten into some serious trouble. So he's trying to juggle his two jobs. He's pre-med. He's trying to keep his grades good. He doesn't want you to just give him a pity grade because he wants to earn it. And he thinks he can have some time over the next, or really over the weekend to get his library work done. But he just need, and he doesn't want to tell you any of this because he doesn't want you to, you know, to just pity him and just give him a free grade. So, um, but that's the situation, and so he just needs some more time. Now, of course, you throw round number two at students up on the board after they've written the messages, and there's just this intake of breath. It's like, oh no! And then you have them assess their messages that they've produced in terms of competence for round number one and round number two, and really with a focus on round number two. The so point being. From the Ron situation, we don't know which Ron it is. And we should, uh, and empathy requires that we, given that Ron said, uh, you know, mentioned family problems, that we treat that as legit. And you see people who empathize with Ron, and the most competent, skilled communicators will immediately go, Ron, you know, how's your family? What's going on? It's the first thing they'll ask. Um, because you don't know which Ron it is. So using this as an exercise, what do I take away from this, and what are my main, you know, kind of points, recommendations here? And I'm watching the clock, so let me finish this up because I want to have time so you folks can, you know, chat with me about, about these issues. Well, here are the recommendations that I teach related to empathy deficits and online communication. Um, the three P's of online communication is something I stress throughout the semester. Um, you know, online communication is public, permanent, and powerful. Um, there, I talk a lot in my classes about there's no such thing as privacy settings. You know, privacy is only as private as you're guaranteed that no one, not a single person, who has access to your material won't export it. And when we talk about this, and we talk about all the exportation of content that goes on from supposed friends, um, students are stunned. They really, they've grown up in an age in which they don't, realize that online privacy is an oxymoron. Um, we talk a lot about in our classes, and I do in my interpersonal class, about the permanence of online media. Uh, you know, even text. Um, you know, the former mayor of Detroit, Kwame Kilpatrick, was, was sent to prison because of text messages that were sent, and he perjured himself on the stand. Uh, so we don't think of texts as being permanent, but the you know the court order, some you know called up the phone records and the, and the text content. It's all there in a server. And then powerful in terms of shaping people's reactions. People have huge, you know, I go all the way back to my opening story. This simple email sent by an angry student, I had huge reactants, and then he had huge reactants. I mean, it's really powerful in shaping our impressions and how we communicate. Um, I tell my students to practice the art of drafts. Because we're kind of in an empathy deficient position to start with, um, create the draft first and, and store it, and then come back to it, especially if you're in an angry state of mind. Um, my esteemed colleague and spouse, uh, Dr. Kelly Morrison, 
you know, does this with me all the time. <laughs> Wait 24 hours, Steve. I hear you typing loudly. <laughs> Don't hit send. Um, and then last but not least, um, if it's a problematic situation, and this is the trick with the Ron situation, take it offline. Take it offline. Um, go to a medium, that, and by offline I mean go to phone, go to Skype, even though it's online, but it allows Skype allows for feedback. Um, or face-to-face -face if you can, if it's at all possible. And then last and definitely not least, um, whether you're in a text-based environment or whether you're one that allows feedback, um, always go through this kind of empathy check, you know, perspective take, um, express empathic concern, which, of course, is the key to online support. Um, and, and, and watch your degree of respect. Um, you know, we talk a lot in, in in our classes, and I do in my class, about about courtesy, both online and offline, and respectfulness um, and civility. And this was the key thing that I forgot, even though I teach this stuff when I was dealing with my angry student, and then I turned around in the message that followed and apologized. Um, but let's open it up now, because I have some other exercises which I do in class, but I'm just looking at the clock and I've talked a bit over, so please. Um, uh, you know, um, any any and all questions that people have, let's open up and chat a bit about this. So I'd love to hear your feedback. Yes, um, Steve, um, Rebecca actually had a question um, about the exercise, the Ron dilemma. Um, she asked, um, if Ron is a Rhonda, do people change their responses? Ooh, that's such a cool question. Um, <laughs> you know, all of our communication, I, mean, I think about what pops into mind is Galen Bodenhausen's work on categorical impressions. And the um, it's really preconscious um, our our processing of gender. Um, the two Galen Bodenhausen is this brilliant um, uh, cognitive psychologist, and he does work on which is included in in my book about um, categorical impressions and how we process people with it's preconscious before we even realize we're doing it. We process people uh, in terms of in terms of these categorical filters, and the two biggest are gender and ethnicity. Um, and so the short answer to your question is, is if Ron is Ron, do people change their responses? Absolutely. Um, the question is, how do they change their responses? Um, and what you get is, uh, and I haven't done this. So I'm not, I'm, I think it would be really interesting, actually, to, to try this. Mix it up, and, and then what you'd want to look at is look at whether there is a, um, in a sense, a sex-by-sex -sex effect. So if women are paired with 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 woman, what if man is paired with woman? If if woman is paired with man, et cetera, and, and mix it up, we actually and I I'm not sure which way it would cut, honestly. Um, you know, women um, certainly people make attributions about uh, about Ron in this particular case and about his degree of incompetence. I'm just not sure how gender stereotypes about women would plug in and reacting to Rhonda, whether men would be naturally more inclined to be empathic toward her or treat her with greater disrespect. I don't know. It's a really interesting question. But my guess is that there would be differences. And the differences would also probably be bounded by whether it was female, female, male, male. Because um, I know the absolutely the most abusive people to Ron are the men. Um, women tend to be uh, more empathic toward Ron than, than men are, regardless of whether you make it via email or face-to-face. -face. Um, and so it would be really interesting to mix it up. And, um, you know, I'm sitting there thinking about your question. I'm going, why haven't I done that yet? Can I rip that? Is that something to do in my class? I'm going to. I'm going to. This is what we do, right? As fellow teachers, we rip each other's material. Uh, but that's an awesome, awesome question. And, and try it. See what happens. And I will, too. Uh, and then we can talk about it in the weeks to come about what happened. What happened when Ron was Rhonda? <laughs> Sweet. Uh, uh, what other questions do folks have? Um, well, one thing, we're, we're uh, taking questions. So again, please feel free to uh, use the chat function there. And um, in the pull-down menu, you can select all, all panelists. And that way, we'll make sure that uh, no one misses your question. Um, one question. Well, let, um, let me jump in. Actually, actually, Stacy, can I jump in for just a sec? Yeah. Sure. I should have said this up front, folks, and I apologize. Um, because of our short time today, I mean, I threw just a bunch of stuff up real quick, and we'll just chat a little bit here. But I really consider this part of a broader conversation that we as interpersonal teachers have amongst ourselves about things that work and things that don't work 
in the classroom and different interesting content. And so please, 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 um, if you're interested in any of this or in talking about other things with me, contact me via email um, or, uh, you know, as I mentioned at the beginning, I'm up on Facebook. Um, and here's my email address. Um, don't hesitate to do that. I love talking with other interpersonal instructors about, you know, talking shop basically with other interpersonal instructors about what we do inside and outside the classroom. But I wanted to emphasize that. Sorry, Stacy. Go ahead. No, that's great. That's great. Um, another question um, is um, as society becomes more technologically advanced, I mean, what are the implications um, for students, I guess, um, as far as uh, empathy um, and uh, their ability to have empathy, I guess? Well, I, I, it's a fantastic question. Um, I encourage all of you, if you haven't yet, uh, and I know many of you probably have, um, to Google uh, brain plasticity um, and uh, you know look through some of the recent research over the past few years on brain plasticity. Um, the model that many of us, I, I've got to be careful about saying that. I don't know how many of you are 50 or older like me. <laughs> So maybe it's maybe it's not so much true, but but the model that many of us who are over forty grew up with um, of brain development was kind of this model where the concrete is set in the first you know five to ten years. You know, you grow up and you, you know the first few years really count, and then you kind of become the person you are, and then it's set, and you basically carry that around the, the rest of your days. Um, the research coming up in in, in and brain development and neurology now suggests that that's completely wrong. And in fact, pretty much throughout our lifespan, our brains are, are constantly adapting to how we live our daily lives. And, and this is known as brain plasticity. So as I tell my students, we train our brains into different competencies through how we live our lives every day, moment to moment. And one of the most Frightening implications of this is the splintered attention research, because if you if you spend your daily life multitasking constantly, your phone is always on and you've always got multiple applications running up on your computer and you've also got the TV on and, and you're doing something else. You're always doing four or five things at once. What you're doing is you're flitting attention back and forth between these things very rapidly. Um, well, your brain very quickly adapts to only being able to do that, because that's what you're requiring. The brain is very plastic in terms of its, of its competencies and abilities. And so what then happens is if you're faced with a task in, what you must, in which you must dedicate focal attention for an extended time span, you can't. And this is what I see, I don't know if any of you see this within your classes, but I see this increasingly with my students who live lives of splintered attention. And then you put them in an environment like an exam where for two hours they have to sit and only do one task, and they find it really, really difficult to do so. Well, if you take that research and you apply it to the question that you just asked, Stacey, of empathy deficits, I find it really frightening. Uh, I find the, the implications for the culture at large pretty frightening because what you have is uh, people who spend more and more time only in text-based environments, we know that text-based environments are empathy-reduced. So there's a greater level of instability that people opine and lament uh, about, you know, and, 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 you know, oh, how everybody's so rude in the Internet and this kind of thing. Um, but also, if we're immersed in that environment for the majority of our communication, our ability then to empathize with others will be reduced over time. Um, and there's some really interesting research that actually dovetails with this on um, the link between physical activity and mood states. Um, the more act physically active, the more physically, uh, you know, the more more often somebody works out, for example, the the better their mood states. I mean, David Myers found this is one of the strongest predictors of hap of human happiness. It's just physical fitness. Well, you have a, if you have a culture that's spending more and more time online, sitting, staring at screens, communicating with others in text-based only environments. You're going to have a culture that's increasingly in negative mood states, low empathy, and expressing themselves angrily online. And I think that's one of the reasons why you see just the level of vitriol uh, in online postings. But again, you won't, you wouldn't see face to face. So it's, I, yeah, I, I find it um, kind of a frightening implication if you put all these things together. 
we have another question about the uh, the RON activity. Um, this is from Bobby Elaine Lee. Um, have you ever tried the RON activity with half the class creating an email response and half the class creating a face-to-face -face response? This is exactly what I want you all to do. Right. I mean, this 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 is how it should be. And I don't mean to sound so directive there, but 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 this is like that's totally the way to do it. Um, what you you know, it's basically a controlled experiment, right? You know, you're manipulating face to face versus versus online, and you can just assign it to half the class for this. And and one of the ways you can do this is actually within the group discussions, and you just you can hand the run to, you know, if you break the class up into, say, five groups or six groups or whatever, depending on, you know, each group about five people, depending on the size of your class, and then you give, like, half the groups, Ron, face-to-face, -face. you know, he shows up at your apartment and he's, you know, obviously distraught or whatever, and then half of half the people uh, via email, and then see what they do. Um, and I've done a variation on this before, and very predictably, uh, what you get is um, people who, who, but what you also have to say is you have to say to people that they have to respond. So, so you sit down at your laptop and type out a message to Ron saying blank. So you make them, so you make their, because that's the key, making their communicative response online. And then half the people you, you're, you're talking to Ron face to face. Um, and when you do that, what you see, and when I've done that, uh, what I see is, is very predictably. Um, the people who, who type Ron the email, oh man, they go off on Ron. Uh, I actually saw one. <laughs> oh, this doesn't make any sense at all. It's so weird. Um, where the the student wrote, it was an individual student. I did it as a as a take home assignment, and they and they wrote, and the student wrote, uh, I would I would shoot Ron an email that said, Ron, you stupid jerk, you're just a total blow off, I knew it, I'm going to make sure you flunk this class, and then I'd hit send and flick him off. <laughs> Some of you are going, you'd hit send and flick him off, and the point of flicking him off would be, what? Because no, I didn't say that to the student, I'm just thinking, you know, so people get very wound up online. Um, you know, their anger is just unabated, and it's not you know, moderated at all by being able to see or hear the person and see the person reacting. You know, oh, you're so angry. Don't be angry at me kind of thing. Um, so, yes, this is, to get back to your question, this is exactly how you should do it. I think, I think and then see what you find. Then let me know. Um, see, see how it divides out in, in your classes. But, yeah, it's, it's, that's the way it should be done. It would be really cool to do that. Great. Um, and, of course, we welcome any ideas that you all may have, any teaching ideas, um, uh, that you all have used successfully in the classroom at dealing with uh, online competence, right, Steve? Um, and I want to see if there's any other activities that that uh, that have worked for you, just even brief kinds of activities. You know, and things that you don't work them. too, because that's often so okay. instructive. Yeah. For us. You know, you try some, you know, um, you know, something I've suggested that doesn't work, or or you know, you've tried something and it didn't work. So sometimes our failures are so much more instructive than our. Um, than our successes. Do, do we have time for just a quick additional exercise, Stacy? This one will just take like 30 seconds. Sure. I don't know where oh, the people yeah. still uh -huh. We sure do. Um, yeah. Because here's, here's another in-class exercise I do activity, and it's, it's a simple one, and it's really a cool provocative one as well. Um, you just, just tell your students to dig up or find the most recent, nastiest, text or email they received, or what could be wall post, you know, whatever. As long as it's a text-based message, they were on the receiving end. Uh, you know, this is a friend or family member or somebody sent to them that just, like, rocked them to the core because it was so mean. Um, I have people bring those messages in and make sure there's no identifying information. that They're, they're not going to share this with people and say, oh, this is the person who sent it to me. I always say, no names, no names. Um, but you have them bring it in, and then you, or, or just, again, you can do this online, just say, you know, identify it. And then you can do like a one-page paper analysis. This is a critical reflection paper. It's a great assignment for doing this, um, in which you have them identify the external causes for that message. So it plays off a fundamental attribution error in our overwhelming tendency to attribute um, uh, internal causes to behavior, 
which is really amplified online as well, which also dovetails with the online empathy deficit. So you think about what is this a recipe for disaster when you're dealing with conflict or anger, which is why you've got to take it offline. Because online, in text-based environments, fundamental attribution error is amplified. Then you've got less empathy. <laughs> so now I think you're saying this to me because you're a jerk, and what's more, I don't feel anything for you. So I'm just going to go off on you. And what, we, what I have people do is, is bring these messages in, and what they have to do is identify, think, and reflect on what are the external causes for why this person might have sent this message. Um, you know, what, just speculate if they don't know. So what, was the person having a terrible day at work? Did they just lose a job? Did they do terribly on an exam? Or very commonly, had you just said or done something to them that provoked them to lash out at you. So you get them thinking about the external causes for other people's bad behavior and in, in analyzing an actual message. Um, and when you get people doing that, what in effect is a kind of stealth route into perspective taking, it really broadens people's perspective on the message. And then you have them comment on the message and have them perspective take. Would you, if you had those things going on in your life, if you'd just been provoked and had done terribly on an exam and didn't get any sleep because your next door neighbor was playing music loud all night and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all these other factors are going on, would you have communicated in the same way? And quite often what students will conclude by that is, yeah, actually, I seeing it that way, I, I realize now they were provoked or they, I would have. And that allows me to empathize with the person better and deal with them ultimately more respectfully. Um, so it's a cool little, you know, using actual messages they've received, it's a cool little critical reflection uh, assignment can be done, you know. You can do it as, a, as an in-class activity, but, usually, you know, one page, like, critical self-reflection paper is a real good way to do it, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, we'll take um, one more question here. Um, this basically asks about challenges, other challenges to interpersonal communication online. What things do you notice that, that uh, students struggle with as far as um, interpersonal communication online? Well, I think the, um, you know, if I go back to what I um, mentioned earlier, kind of just real quickly, because I know I went through so much so fast, um, I, I think it's the tendency to go straight to text-based text -based, uh, communication whenever they're facing a difficult challenge. Uh, and there's a reason for it, and it's cognitive effort and it, driven by empathy. If I talk to you on the phone, if I see you face to face, it's going to be really, really draining. Um, and so my natural inclination, just from a simple effort and emotional involvement perspective, is actually, to, as I mentioned earlier, to trend toward text-based. Um, and, and, you know, you think about what that means. If I'm, um, if I'm really upset with you, I'm going to fire a text message off to you. Instead of calling you or going face-to-face. Uh, uh, -face. Why? Because I don't want to see your reaction. I don't want to have to deal with the repercussions. And so alerting students to, the, um, to this idea that, that text-based communication is not always going to be the most competent route of choice um, is it, huge. Because they've grown up in an environment in which that's just the go-to mechanism, and yet many of them don't recognize the, the cognitive underpinnings of why they trend that way, meaning because it's easier and less effortful on an emotional standpoint. Kelly and I, my, again, my, my spouse and wife, or my spouse and wife, my spouse and colleague, um, we really drilled this into our boys growing up. Um, and it was kind of funny because the outcome was, and I'll share this real quick because I know we are over, and I appreciate people hanging out with me so long today. Um, it was really funny because what would happen is, with our <laughs> it happens with all our boys, we can always tell when they're in a fight with a romantic partner or with a, a friend, because what will happen is the rate of texting will accelerate back and forth. They'll be hitting the keys harder, and then, which is what we've coached them to do since they were younger, they'll take it offline. They'll they'll be this. There'll be the sudden closing of the phone, and then they go right upstairs to their room, and we hear a phone call happening. 
<laughs> and the moment that happens, it's a nightmare for them. Our poor children having to grow up with two social scientists and you know relational people as, as parents. You know, the, you know, immediately one or the other, either Kelly or I will go upstairs and we'll go knock, knock, knock. You know, is everything okay? Yes, we're just having a fight. <laughs> And they're on the phone, you know, talking it through, which is what you want to do. You don't want to try and resolve it via text or email or something. You know, take it to take it offline. Um, and so we've, you know, we've trained them up as I guess well as we could. It, but it's um, it's hard to get students to think no. It's um, offline is better and even more efficient for getting things solved. Uh, you know, little things like scheduling lunch dates or or things that. You know, little points of confusion relationally that might just, oh, if we just talk about it, we can resolve it in five minutes instead of back and forth text and getting all this escalation um, through lack of empathy. So it's it's interesting. That's great, Steve. Um, well, uh, I think we'll wrap things up as of now. Um, we want to thank everybody for attending today. We also want to let you know that we will be archiving um, this webinar on our website. It will be at bedfordstmartins.com slash webinars. And uh, you will receive that link in a follow-up email to you. And uh, Steve has been very gracious to um, to uh, provide his email address here. And um, uh, as he said, you're welcome to contact him with any any further questions. But thank you so much for attending. Thank you, Steve. Um, yes, well, wanna... Thank you, folks, for for you know sharing so much of your time this afternoon, and maybe for some of you this morning with me. I really appreciate it. It's, uh, it's just really uh, sweet to connect with fellow interpersonal teachers. And drop me a line or, or shoot me a Facebook message if you feel inclined, and we can continue our chat in the future. That's great. Thanks so much, everyone. Thanks for attending. <laughs>